Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Okay, so last time, uh, last time we looked at a function, <coughs> a function whose Jacobian exists, which is to say you can compute, you compute all the partial derivatives. Uh, nevertheless, this function is not differentiable, which is a little bit scary to, to think that, oh, we've got the definition of derivative, and then we've got Jacobian, and we know that when the derivative exists, the Jacobian exists, and the Jacobian is the derivative, but what if the Jacobian exists? Does that mean the derivative exists? <coughs> that doesn't mean that. So it, in principle, it's possible to have a function that has a Jacobian, but not a derivative. And so we were in the midst of, of providing ourselves the safe space in which to act. How to tell, when, when is it that you can compute the Jacobian and you're sure that the derivative also exists. So what is the condition? So we're Well, it has to do with the partial derivatives. Oh yeah, it's that part of C1. Yeah, when the function is C1. So a function is C1 when all the partial derivatives exist and furthermore, those partial derivatives are continuous at the point in question. So if your favorite point, if you've got your function f and your favorite point a, if all the partials of that function exist at a, and furthermore, all of the partial derivatives are continuous at your favorite point a, then the function is differentiable there, and you can compute the Jacobian, and uh, the Jacobian and the derivative are the same. Okay, so we were in the midst of proving this result. So does everybody remember where we were? Okay. And we were doing the mean value theorem trick. Okay, specifically, uh, what we had said, to, to give you some context, so this is proof and continued. Continued. We had been talking about a function, little f, that goes from u, a subset of Rn, to Rm, and that u was open, and that a was some point, did I say a? Yeah, probably. Uh, a is some point in u. And then, then I mentioned, I said, well, uh, this, this function, because it's going to Rm, our mic, uh, you can imagine that it has m coordinate functions. And for a function to be differentiable, that, that's exactly when all of the coordinate functions are differentiable. So what did I say in response to that? So I'll say, well, in, in, in that case, I can, I can assume that the range is just the reals. The range is scalars. Because if I prove it, uh, I could either just assume without loss of generality that the range is the reals, or if you like, I could do it one coordinate function at a time, say, I can prove it for the first one, I can prove it for the second one, I can prove it for all of them. And then once I've proved it for all of them, then, I've, then I'm finished. But rather than saying I'm going to prove it for all of them, I'm just going to say, like I said last time, <coughs> without loss of generality, I'll take f to be taking vector inputs and producing scalar outputs. <coughs> <coughs> And if you like, you can substitute in doing all the coordinate functions individually. OK, then we said, OK, furthermore, to make the proof comprehensible, uh, u, in principle, can be Rn. So it could be R2, it could be R2 million, whatever you like. But to, to try and make it comprehensible to us so that you can see the action that's occurring in the proof, I'm, gonna, I'm going to proceed as if u is a subset of R3. Because otherwise, the argument gets kind of crazy and it's hard to tell what's happening. OK. <coughs> so then I'll do this, and u being a subset of R3. So specifically, let's consider that a <coughs> is equal to this vector, a1, a2, a3 and that we've got some increment, h is h1, h2, h3. 
And then what we want to show, what we want to show is that the limit as vector h goes to vector zero of one over length h of the increment of the function from a So that's incrementing the function. And then we want to say subtract the Jacobian of the function at a <coughs> applied to increment h. We want to show that this is what? Zero. And what kind of zero? Well, strictly speaking, it would need to be a vector. But because I said without loss of generality, blah, 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 OK, it's a scalar. OK, so we want to show this. And what we were focusing on last time is we were focusing on this. So let's, let's refocus specifically on the increment of the function. So focusing here, <clears throat> we said, OK, we've got f of a1 plus h1, a2 plus h2, a3 plus h3, and we're going to subtract from that f of a1, a2, a3. And then what follows is a kind of cute way to consider this subtraction to actually, to actually be the sum of three individual subtractions. So that's because we're in R3. If we were in R7, then we'd say that we're going to construe this as being the sum of seven individual subtractions. And if we were in R2451, it would be the sum of 2451 individual subtractions. Okay, but I'm doing three so that you can definitely see what's occurring. So I'm going to take this first f and leave it in graphite and say that this is a, uh, f of a1 plus h1, a2 plus h2, a3 plus h3. So I just, all I did was copy that first term. Now from that, I'm going to subtract something else. I'm going to subtract what I'm going to do, since this is the, I'm going to make a, a whole kind of table of subtractions. And because this is the first row, I'm going to only play with the first variable. I'm going to leave the other variables the same. That is to say that this one is still going to be a2 plus h2. And this one is still going to be a3 plus h3. So those are the same. Those are the same, but then now the first one's going to be different. What's the first one going to be? A1. A1. <clears throat> so observe that in this first row that I've written, only the first variable changed. So I subtracted this red bit, and if I, want, if I want this to remain an equation, that means I must add it back in. So I'll add it back in. <clears throat> so f of A1 and then A2 plus h2, a3, plus h3. And now I want to perform the same trick, but because now I'm on the second row, I'm only going to play with the second variable. I'm only going to play with the second variable, so I'm going to subtract some amount. It's going to be f. And then what's going to have to be the first variable? a1, because I want that to be the same. And what's going to have to be the third variable? Right, because I want that to be the same. So observe that the first, the first and third variables are the same. It's the second variable that I need to change. And what am I going to change it to? A2. A2. OK, now I subtracted this much just now. And in order for this to remain an equation, that means I need to add it back in. So I'll add it back in. <coughs> So this is, uh, so A1, A2, and then A3 plus H3. And now, because this is the third row, which variables will stay the same? First two, and which one will change? The third one. In particular, what will it change to? So let me write, notice that I'm writing it in graphite, <laughs> for one thing. So A1 and A2 need to be the same. And then the third one is the one that's changing. What's it changing to? Just A3. And notice that 
these two that are in graphite are the same as these two that are in graphite. So I, altogether, I've done a, 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 a fairly fancy way of, of doing nothing. Okay. So I haven't, I haven't changed the equation. But what I want you to observe is that because, because in the first row, because the, the, because the second and third variables are not changing, only the first variable is changing, I'm going to imagine this as occurring on the interval A1 to A1 plus H1. Now, I've, in making my drawing there, I've made an assumption that H1 is positive by drawing it further to the right. So if H1 was negative, I'd need to switch the drawing around, but I'm not going to draw a, a new drawing for every possibility. So understand that this, this drawing is making a slight assumption that may not necessarily be true. <clears throat> okay, similarly, what, what interval is this occurring on? Right. A2 to A2 plus H2. And similarly, this one is occurring on A3 to A3 plus H3. <coughs> so now, just like in the fundamental theorem, or if you like, just like in the mean, th mean value theorem, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, this F this f, considering it to be, this row to be just a function of the first variable, then I can invoke the, 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 the mean value theorem on the first variable. And in particular, what the mean value theorem tells, tells us is that there has to be a value inside of this interval where I can represent this difference as the derivative multi uh, at that, evaluated at that value multiplied by uh, the, the, the length of the interval. Okay, so in particular, the mean value theorem, I'm going to invoke it three times. Yes? Would you write this repeat I will write it down because I don't think it can be fully set. I, I don't think the full grasp of it can be had without me writing it. So what I'm saying is that I'm going to invoke the mean value theorem three times. But do understand that if this was an n-dimensional problem, I'd be invoking it n times. So specifically, I'm going to invoke the mean value theorem once to give me a B1 twice to give me a B2, and I'm just pointing in arbitrary places just so you don't think that they're in the middle or something like that. Like what I mean is right in the very middle. So they could be, in principle, they could be anywhere in there. So specifically what I'm saying <coughs> is by the mean value theorem, there exists a B1 in the interval A1 to A1 plus H1. And again, the same caveat here. I'm, I'm tacitly assuming that H1 is a positive number, because if it were negative, this wouldn't be an interval, and that wouldn't make sense. Uh, but the proof will go through just the same, even if you were to go back and carefully say, well, if H is positive, negative, and all that. OK, so there's a B1 in here. Such that what? <clears throat> such that this difference, such that this difference, <clears throat> f of a1 plus h1, a2 plus h2, a3 plus h3, minus f at a1, a2 plus H2, A3 plus H3 is equal to what? It'll be the partial, but partial with respect to the first variable of the function <coughs> evaluated at A1, A2, A3, and then multiplied by H1. So this is, the, this is the mean value theorem. Usually, the way we, we've been writing it is we wrote 
uh, this one divided by h, and we had solved for the derivative. Okay, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it in that way because this way is more convenient. So there's a B1 that does this. There's a B1 that does this. And then now you can imagine that, that I write, sim I'll just write similarly, there's a B2 that does a similar thing and a B3 that does uh, other similar thing. <coughs> Yes? Hold on, just a second. My my brain is. Because it should be d f of c times b minus a. Ah, okay. Yes. <laughs> this okay. Yeah. Brain total. Thank you. My brain totally went sideways there for a minute. The, <laughs> the other two coordinates are not changing, so they have to remain the same. <laughs> so a two plus h two, a three plus h three. And then this, this one is the only one that's changing. We're only invoking the mean value theorem in the, in the first coordinate. So that's the only one that changes. So that's the magic place where you can evaluate uh, the partial derivative. <coughs> OK. So similarly, I guess let's write down all of them. So there also exists a b2 in the interval a2, a2 plus h2, such that, well, let's write it down. This difference, f of a1, a2 plus h2, a3 plus h3, minus f of a1, a2, a3 plus h3. Let's see if we can get it right is equal to, to what? <clears throat> so which two are staying still? The first and the third. So it has to be the second partial of f. The first and the third coordinate have to, be st have to remain constant. So this will be a1. And the last one will be a3 plus h3. And then the third one is the one that's moving. The third one is the one where we invoke the mean value theorem. What goes in the third coordinate? B2. B2. And then this has to be multiplied by the increment H2. OK. And there is a B3 in the interval A3 to A3 plus H3, such that so now which ones are staying still and which one's moving? The first two stay still, and it's the third one that's moving. So, so it'll be a1, a2, a3 plus h3, and then minus <coughs> f of a1, a2, <coughs> a3. This will be the third partial of f evaluated at the first two stay still and the last one moves to B3 and then H3. <clears throat> okay, terrific. So any question about, uh, about what we have so far? Okay, <clears throat> pardon me. So if we write just to give, uh, just to give these things names. So this this new coordinate where we're where we're doing b1 for the first one in the first coordinate and b2 in the second coordinate and b3 in the third coordinate. Let's give a name to all of those. <coughs> so just as a matter of writing it down, we'll write <coughs> that c1 is this first place. C1 is B1, A2 plus H2, A3 plus H3, and C2 is that one. So A1, B2, A3 plus H3, and C3 
is this last one, uh, A1, A2, B3. Okay, so as a result of that, we can write, <coughs> pardon me, uh, we can write uh, this difference in the following nice kind of way. Then the function increment f of a plus h minus f of a, which is what, which is what we've currently tr been trying to deal with, is equal to the sum of these three things, that one, that one, and that one. Because it was, it was the sum of these three, one, two, three, and now we're replacing it with these, one, two, three. So the, the, the increment of the function is the sum of those. <coughs> so this would be d1 evaluated at our, the name we gave it was c1, and then h1, plus d2, uh, sorry, d1 of f, evaluated at C1, H1, plus D2 of F evaluated at C2, H2, <coughs> plus D3 of F evaluated at C3, H3. <coughs> They're scalars. They are, they are the compo components of the increment h. So specifically, now we can, I can rearrange this because this looks like a dot product, because it looks like a dot product, I'm going to write the derivatives in a row matrix, and I'm going to write the h as a, a column matrix, as, as it is. So then this will be <coughs> d1 f c1 is the first column d2 f c2 is the third column and d3 f c3 is the third column and this this is applied to the increment vector h okay <clears throat> so what i want you to observe is that the increment of the function f of a plus h minus f of a is exactly equal to this. And we, we were able to arrange this exactness because we had to invoke the mean value theorem three times because we were in three dimensions. If we were in 25 dimensions, we'd have to invoke the mean value theorem 25 times. But, but, we only have to invoke the mean value theorem finitely many times, which means that this works. Okay, so now look back. What we want to do is we want to show that this limit is zero. And what we have just dealt with, we dealt with this term right here, and that term is equal to that. Now we need to deal with this term. Now what is the Jacobian? It's almost that, but there's a big difference. That is to say, notice where is this one being evaluated? at C1, this one at C2, and this one at C3, whereas the Jacobian is the matrix of partial derivatives, where each partial derivative is in each column, just like this, except where are these being evaluated? At A. So these are being evaluated at C, and these are being evaluated at A. So there's no reason to assume that, that they're, they're equal, uh, at least not at first. So let's, let's substitute this in. Let's, let's write down what this is. So notice the other term, that was the Jacobian of F evaluated at A, <coughs> applied to H, that was the other term. It is equal to D1F evaluated at A in the first column d2f evaluated also at a in the second column, and d3f evaluated at a in the third column, and then applied to h. So they're quite similar. They're quite similar, except these are all evaluated at a, and those are all evaluated at c. Okay, so now I'm going to plug these in. 
I'm going to plug these two, these two things in into these two positions. Okay, we're going to see what happens when we do that. So you plug into the limit and you obtain the limit uh, as h <coughs> goes to 0, 1 over length h. And then we have d1f evaluated at c1, d2f evaluated at c2, D3F evaluate at C3H. That's the increment of the function, and now I'm going to subtract from it the Jacobian applied to H. So minus D1F evaluate at A, D2F evaluate at A, D3F evaluate at A, H. Okay, now, do you observe that uh, h is a common factor? Okay, so we could, we could factor it out. <clears throat> so I'll do that. So this is the limit as h uh, goes to 0. And I, I'm going to factor it out, but... Now, because this, is, because this is a row matrix multiplied by a column vector, when you factor it out, where does it have to be? It has, has to be on the right, right? And it can't, you can't factor it out to the left like you might if it were a scalar because, well, in the end, does matrix product commute? It doesn't, right? So when you factor it out, remember, it has to be factored out on the same side it was, it was on to begin with. So what I'll do is I'll move this H to be over with the other one and, 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 and factor it out. Okay. So D1, F, C1. D2, F at C2. D3, F at C3. Minus D1, F at A, D2F at A, D3F at A, and then H over H. <coughs> okay, so now, our hypothesis, the hypothesis that we jumped into with this theorem was that F is C1. That was our hypothesis, that it was C1. And remind me, what does C1 mean? Right. Not only do the partial derivatives exist, they're continuous. So until now, until now, all that I've used is that the partial derivatives exist. That's all that I've used. The, par the existence of the partial derivatives is enough to get here. What I haven't used is that the partial derivatives are continuous. So how can I use that? Well, let's think about it. So go back, to, go back to where I was talking about how we're selecting B. So the mean value theorem is saying that for all of these n intervals, three intervals, for all of these, somehow the mean value theorem is able to select a B, a B1, and a B2, and a B3. Now I want you to imagine what we have control over, because we're computing a limit as h goes to 0, we have a control over the size of all these h's. Now imagine, a1 is fixed and can't move, but we have control over h and we can make it as small as we want. So suppose that we start making the, the h small, then where must b go? It has to go to a. It can't go anywhere else. Because if I have control over the h, that means I have control over the size of this interval. And if I squeeze this interval until it's coming to a single point at a1, that means that b1 is going to a1. That also means that b2 is going to a2. It also means that b3 is going to a3. And generally, bk is going to ak. 
So do you observe that because we have control over H, we can force all of the Bs to get arbitrarily close to the As? Okay, so I'm going to sit on that for a minute because I'm not getting a good, I'm not, it doesn't look like a, I'm getting good response. This is the, besides the idea of invoking the mean value theorem a whole bunch of times, this is the key point. We have n intervals. We needed to select a point in each one of them. We did that with the mean value theorem. Now, because we have control over h, because we're computing a limit with respect to h, we can make all of those selections, all of the b selections, get arbitrarily close to a's. Yes? So, just to make sure it was caused, that causes all the c's to go to a, therefore this is zero. That's right. So, well, almost, right? Because there's one, there's one minor issue. So, to restate what you said, for example, just in that first component right there, those two that you can see, D1 of F at C1 and D1 of F at A. So what I'm saying is that we can make C1 go to A because C1 is this. And if both of the H's are going to zero, that's, that means that the second and third component surely have to go to A2 and A3, but so does the third component because it's, it's selected by the mean value theorem and it's getting squeezed just as hard. So C1, we can make it go to A. But if we make C1 go to A, does that necessarily mean that D1, uh, that, that this one will go to that one? Okay, so let's back up. Let's have an aside, because there's a point here that students historically fumble a little bit. As an aside, consider this. This is now from Calculus 1. I'm not talking about the current problem. I'm talking about Calculus 1. So I'll try and use different, different letters. So suppose that we have <coughs> y going to z. The limit is, and, these, and y and z are both scalars. And we're doing h of y. So y is going to z. What is this? What will this evaluate to? And, and under what, what circumstances? Yeah, so what is it? When h is continuous, when h is continuous right? You, you sort of want to be able to just say, ah, it's h of z. When can you say that it is h of z? When is this true? When h is continuous. If H is continuous, you can't make, you can't move from the left-hand side to the right. Because, for example, I could consider this function right here. So in the first place, is this function continuous? It's not, right? So if you compute, the, if this is at height 1 and that one's at height 2, then what's the limit of the, of the function's output as you go to this place? 1. But the actual function output is 2. So the only time that you can exchange limit for just plugging in, the only time you can do that is when the function is continuous at the point in question. So, so that's an aside. So no, back, back to the question. <clears throat> this is equal to, <clears throat> this has to be uh, equal to what? So in the first place, uh, do you observe that <clears throat> that this term is going to be bounded? This this term is bounded because this is of 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 degree one, and this one is also of degree one. So this term can't can't blow up. This first column has to converge to that first column. Why? Because because it's continuous, and the second column has to converge to the second to this second column because of continuity, and this column to that column because of continuity. So this is the place where continuity comes in. You can't proceed past this place unless you have continuity. So continuing the, the previous from the previous, this is just equal to 0 because d1 of f 
d2 of f and d3 of f exist and are continuous. Okay. So what this is telling you is that if you have a, if you have a function that's C1, then, then the Jacobian really is a legitimate way to proceed. And you can feel safe and you don't have to worry about that we're dealing with one of those other crazy functions like we did last time. So any question about this? Okay. So C1 functions, these are, these are the ones that, that we like. Okay, so now a brief remembrance of, of all things linear algebra. So you took a, yes? I do have one question, and this is our first thing. Uh, is it wrong to write the uh, h vector over magic of h as h hat in this class? Uh, it won't be wrong as long as you write down that's what you mean. Okay. So what, he, what he's saying is that in, in physics classes and classes that are getting close to physics classes, like arguably maybe this one, but, but maybe not, uh, uh, unit vectors are frequently written with pointy hats. Instead of, instead of arrow hats, they have pointy hats like carrots. And that, that means that I'm talking about a vector that has length one. But at any rate, I'm not using that notation. But as long as you write it on your papers and the, the grader understands, it'll be fine. <clears throat> okay, so, <clears throat> so this is a brief uh, review of, of some linear algebra matters. So you need to review linear algebra. <laughs> so have a, have a, you know, spend, spend the weekend reminding yourself what all that's about. Uh, to a large extent, to a large extent, solving linear algebra is looking at something like this. You could say, well, I want to consider the equation a11 uh, x1 plus a12 uh, x2 plus a13 x3 and then a21 x1 plus a22, x2 plus a23, x3, and then a31, x1 plus a32, x3 plus a33, x3, and you want to know all of these equal to whatever your favorite numbers are, b1, b2, and b3. So this comes up under various Situations like this come up all the time in math and science where you have, you have these and what you want to know is that the A's and the B's, they're all known, but the X's, they're unknown. And you want to know, can I solve this equation? So one of the upshots in linear algebra is that this can be represented with matrices and vectors in the following way. You can say that, well, this really represents can be represented as a11, a12, a13, a21, a22, a23, a31, a32, a33. So this matrix right here multiplied by this column vector x1, x2, x3 is equal to this other column vector b1, b2, b3. And then, if we refer to the matrix as just capital A, and if we refer to the vectors with the vector with x's as just x, and the vector with the b's as just b, then all of these equations end up looking like this: a x equal b. And to a to a very large extent, linear. <laughs> this is a summary of all of linear algebra, right here. And and the summary is you need to solve for x. And then there's the question of, well, can you solve for x? Is it possible to solve for x? Uh, if you can solve for x, will the solution be unique? 
or will there be lots of them? Uh, and, and, and questions all, all around this vein. So, so, surely this isn't new to anyone, right? Okay, <clears throat> so just so I can make sure that I have the terminology down. So in your, in your linear algebra class, uh, would you just brief show of hands, was the word surjective using, used? Surjective? A little bit? What about onto? This one? This one's more? Okay, and then injective? A little bit? One to one? More? Okay, so then how about null space? Okay, kernel? Less? Okay, uh, image? I can't, I, can, I don't know what else they would call it. Okay, so, so kind, of, kind of spotty, okay. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, okay, we'll deal with that. <laughs> They're the same. <laughs> so so to, to a large extent, uh, what I said is pairs of synonyms. Okay, <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's review all of these things. So, uh, definition. So, this is the definition of surjective. Surjective. Uh, so, function f from space, from set x to set y from set x to set, to set y, is called surjective when for all y in set y, for all elements y in set y, there exists an element x in set x such that f of x is y. So what that means in terms of equations and in terms of <coughs> linear algebra, what that means, uh, a matrix or a linear map, but I'll just abuse the notation and say a matrix is called surjective when <coughs> Uh, AX equal to B always has a solution. No, it doesn't have to be unique. So, so surjectivity means that it is it is all, it always makes sense to solve. No matter no matter no matter what the right hand side is, it always makes sense to attempt to solve. Uh, but it makes no guarantee about the uniqueness. It makes no guarantee about uniqueness of the solution. There's guaranteed one, but one of the results in linear algebra is that <coughs> how many solutions could there possibly be? There can be zero, or one, or infinitely many, right? <laughs> that's, that's the only possibilities in, in linear algebra. So, as a side note, yes? Well, it, it, de it depends on, surjectivity depends on what you're calling the codomain, the, the, this thing. So, at, at any rate, it, it, sur the, the surjectivity depends on, on, on all of these. It depends on the function, it depends on the domain, it depends on the codomain. <coughs> That's right. So, but I haven't defined image yet, so I can't say it. <laughs> uh, but I will in a minute. Uh, so what is, what is the, the other name for surjective? Onto. Surjective is also known as onto. So that is to say, if you have, if you have uh, a function that's onto, or if you like, if you have a, a matrix, or even better, the linear map defined by that matrix. If, that linear, if the linear map defined by that matrix is onto, you can always solve this equation. Okay, what, 
the next one that sounds like surjective. What is it? Non is itself an adjective in this case. Yes. It is okay. Yes. You could say that the function is onto. An, an, or you could, so in that sense, it's a category and also an adjective. F belongs to the category of, of onto functions. Or you could say it's a red function, it's a blue function, it's an onto function. Yeah. So what's the other one that, sound, that sounds like surjective but isn't surjective? Injective. 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 So f from set y to, uh, sorry, from set x to set y is called injective. When f of x1 equal to f of x2 implies what? That x1 is x2. So what that's saying what that's saying is that if you imagine the function to be a machine, if you imagine the function to be a machine, and you put, uh, you, you imagine that you have an x1 being put in, and you, you witness f of uh, x1 come out, and then you make another copy of the machine, or you just run another copy of it a little bit later, and you put x2 in, and you witness f of x2 come out, and if these are the same, if the outputs were the same, then what? <coughs> then the inputs must have been the same. You can't get the same output in two different ways. That's what injectivity means. That's what it means. It means that, uh, it means that uh, if you have a solution, so if you uh, have solved, the equation f of x is equal to y. So if you've solved it for x, then there's only one solution. So in the, in the, case, of, in the case of linear algebra, uh, a matrix, or better, a linear map, but I'll just write matrix, is called injective when <clears throat> when solu when solutions to this are unique now notably what does that not say It doesn't say anything about whether or not there is one. It doesn't say anything about their existence, right? So you could have a, you could have a, uh, a, a function that is injective, but that doesn't mean that you can solve every possible equation. Okay? Be it only says that if you could solve it, it would surely, th th that the solution would surely be unique. So uh, these, are, these concepts are, uh, oh, before I get too far away from it, just like onto is the synonym for surjective, then what is the synonym for uh, injective? One to one. So we're going to find ourselves uh, having, you know, needing one or the other. So in order to proceed, we're going to say, well, we we need we need surjectivity to go forward. That means that we have to solve an equation. And we're not going to be able to unless it's surjective. And sometimes we're going to say, well, somehow we came up with a solution some way. But we really need the solution to be unique. Then what will we need? Injectivity. We'll need injectivity. And then in other cases, we're going to need both. We can say, well, we really need a solution. And furthermore, we need it to be unique. So we'll need both. And there's a name for both. What's the name for both? Bijectivity. So if you have a function, or if you like, a matrix, 
which is uh, bijective. That means that there always is a solution, and furthermore, that solution is unique. So in the case of linear algebra, what kind of matrices always have a solution, and furthermore, the solution is unique? Square matrices that are invertible. Right? These, are the, these are the only kind that are, that are, uh, that are both. Okay, good. <coughs> Right. It couldn't possibly be both. So let's, let's see why. Let, let, let's, let's dig into that for a minute because it's worth, it'll be worth our time. Because in the end, we have to get really comfortable with these linear algebra ideas of the guaranteed existence of a solution and the guaranteed uniqueness of a solution because that's what happens when the, when the surface is flat. Linear algebra is, you can imagine that it's the special case of this class when the thing we're dealing with is, is flat. Very soon we're going to start dealing with curvy things and we're going to want to know exactly the same thing. When is there a solution? When is it unique? So you've got to be super comfortable with what's happening in linear algebra, otherwise you'll be lost uh, in, 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 in this case. So what was your question? Uh, is it only true whenever, if a matrix is not square invertible, it's not both? Okay, so let's consider, for example, <coughs> let's consider, for example, uh, the following uh, linear function. So t of t of x and y is equal to say something like 2x minus 4y. So in the first place what's the signature of this function? r2 to r1. So now I'll, I'll say, I'll proclaim it's linear. We'll demonstrate it's linear for a, in a minute, but I just proclaim it here and now. It's linear. As a result, it's representable as matrix multiplication. What are the rows and how many rows and columns are there? One row, two columns. So in particular, in particular, this is not square. It's not square. So uh, as a result, as a result, this map couldn't possibly be an invertible map. Okay, let's, let's see why. So let's represent it as a matrix first. So T of X and Y is, what's its matrix? Yeah, <laughs> pretty easy to just read off, right? Two and then in the first column. <clears throat> and then negative four in the second. And then it would need to be multiplied by this column. <clears throat> okay. So, <coughs> uh, here's, here's the question of whether or not this, so our question kind of is right now, is it, is it injective, is it surjective? Is it injective, is it surjective? Let, let's, so what's, how do we address those questions? Solve for x. Solve for x. Okay. Uh, Okay, so is it surjective? Is it surjective? Let's say, uh, is it surjective? So this is a question. So the question is, can you solve, is it possible, to solve t of x and y is equal to z for all z. Can you, can you always do that? Yes. Okay, so the answer is going to be yes, and it's sort of trivially so, because you can just do it right here now. So 2x minus 4y is equal to z, and then, well, well I'll, I'll make my life really simple. I'll just say, I'll, I'll set y to be 0, because why not? I'll just choose y to be 0, and then now I have an even simpler equation. Uh, and then now I want to solve for x. Can I solve for x? Yeah. So x is z over 2. So what, I'm, what this is saying is that, well, uh, from here to here I said let y be 0. So what I want you to observe, if you plug in t of z over 2 
in the first coordinate and zero in the second coordinate, then what do you get? You get z. So yeah, I can, I can always solve for z. So what, is that, what does that mean about this function? Surjective. It's surjective. OK, is it injective? Is it injective? No. It is not. So in order, to, in order to demonstrate that it is not injective, you need to produce for me two different inputs, two different inputs, whose output is the same. OK, so t evaluated at 0, 0 is, of course, 0 because t, because t is linear. OK, and then what, what was another one? Uh, t, 2, 1. 2, 1. Let's check it. So if 2 times 2 is 4, and then minus 4 times 1, that, that's also 4. 4 minus 4, that's 0. So what I'm telling you is that with, if we were standing on the right-hand side of the t machine, and you, and you saw a zero come out, you wouldn't know if, they, if, if the other person on the other side of the machine put in zero, zero, or put in two, one. You wouldn't know. So the t, the t function is not injective. Yes? So using our knowledge mm -hmm. that uh, the only time a, something is bijective is if it's a square invertible matrix. Uh, if we have a non-square invertible matrix, can we just prove for one and then declare the other? Wait a minute, a what? Can we not prove uh, or only a uh, square variable matrix. Okay. So if it's neither of those or only one, uh, can well, we prove it one to just prove only the square matrix? matrices can be invertible. So you can you can say, what if I have a square matrix that is not invertible? Okay, because you couldn't have an invertible matrix that's not square. That doesn't make sense. Right. So do you remember all this stuff? Okay, we've got columns and span and, and, and all of that. All of these are okay words, right? Safe words, span? Okay, good. I'm just, I'm just asking because the last time I taught this course, span was not okay. And I was really concerned. Okay. <clears throat> so, so uh, let's, uh, let's write down uh, all the things that that we need to know. So we need to know all of those and that one. OK. <clears throat> so these are all things that, that are known from, known from linear algebra. So in the first place, one, the following are equivalent, TFAE. So first, so 1.1. Uh, if we have, uh, so we're, we're talking about a linear transformation given by matrix A from Rn to Rm. So we've got, we're talking about a matrix and specifically we're talking about the linear transformation defined by that matrix. Uh, so A is surjective. is equivalent to <clears throat> the image of A, which is equal to the set of all AX, such that X is in Rn. The image is equal to the whole shebang. That is to say that you can reach everything in the in the target space, everything in the codomain from some from at least one point in the domain. Okay, next. <clears throat> one point three. The columns of A span RM. Okay, four. The rows of A are linearly what? Independent. Independent. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, 
okay? AX equal to B is solvable for all B, and where does B have to be sitting? In RM. You can always solve that equation. <clears throat> One point uh, six. The rank of A, which is also the dimension of the image of A, is what? M. That is to say, you consider the space that that you can reach by way of A, by mapping things through A. Then the this, the dimension of that space is M which is to say it's the same dimensionality as the codomain, so you're able to reach all of it. Okay, so the rank of A is the same as the dimension of the image of A, and, and, and it is M. Uh, <coughs> so, 1.7, the row reduced version of A, row reduced A, uh, which in this book anyway, I don't know what, how your other book might have denoted it, denoted A with a tilde hat. So row reduction is a thing, right? It's a thing? Okay. So the row reduced uh, <coughs> has no row containing all zeros. And finally, the last condition that's equivalent to, <coughs> to this, the row reduced A tilde uh, has a pivotal one in every row. Okay, so how about that last phrase, pivotal one? Do we know that one? So, uh, were there any no's? Pivotal one? I've got to guess what we mean. So, what that means is that when, when you do the row reduction, when you do the row reduction, uh, you know, you, you, kind of t you kind of want it to have uh, a one on, the on all the diagonal ones. No. That'd be nice if you could do that. But sometimes <coughs> you have to skip a column. But as long as you can get a one on every row, then it's surjective. But, but if when you're doing the row reduction, you end up getting a, a row that has all zeros in it, that means that the matrix you're dealing with fails to be surjective. It means that you, you're not going to be able to solve everything. You're only going to be able to solve some things. Yes? If it's not all diagonal, then it can't be injective. Well, so what we just wrote is the following are equivalent for surjective. So now we're going to do exactly the same thing right here for injective. <laughs> Uh, of course, the conditions are slightly different. So let's write them down. <clears throat> and two, the following are equivalent. So 2.1, the first condition is that uh, A is injective. And what's the synonym for injective? One to one. <clears throat> <clears throat> So 2.2, 2, uh, solutions to AX equal B are unique. Now, notably, it, it never goes to, you can't say it too many times. I'm putting a star here. Why does that star, why am I starring that? It says it's, <laughs> yeah, it makes no statement about whether or not the solution exists. Okay, it's only saying that suppose you have one, then that's the only one. That's what it's saying. Uh, <clears throat> 2.3, the columns are linearly independent. So notice that is similar to, but different from the other one. What was the other one? The rows are linearly independent. 
So rows being linearly, in <coughs> linearly independent means surjective. Columns being linearly independent means injective. Uh, 2.4, the kernel of A, which is also sometimes written as the null of A, which is equal to the set of all x, inputs x, such that a sends x to 0. So this set, so the kernel is defined in this way. And injectivity is equivalent to saying that the kernel is what? Just, just the set that contains 0. So every linear map has to send 0 to 0. So all of them send 0 to 0. That's a necessary, that, that, that's a consequence of being linear. So to be injective means that there it, you, you must send 0 to 0. And furthermore, you can send nothing else to 0. Okay, so that's injectivity. <coughs> 2.5, an equivalent condition. The only solution to AX equal to zero is what? Is X is zero, so that's the only one. <clears throat> Did I miss one? Uh, it's 2.6. No, I'm reading it. The dimension, <laughs> the dimension of the kernel of this matrix is what? Z zero. <laughs> right. It's the other one. <laughs> the, 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 the image has to, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what a dimension is? It's this. It's right there. The image is the set. You take all the inputs, <coughs> apply the matrix to it, and, and collect all the outputs. <coughs> so this is the definition of image. It's the right. Question? Um, what does the middle thing say on 1.6? The, the rank of A, yeah. and a synonym for that is the dimension of the image of A has to be M. <clears throat> okay, so the dimension of the kernel is uh, 0, <clears throat> 2.6. Uh, thank you, 7 comes after 6, doesn't it? 2.7. How about uh, the dimension of the image of A? Oh, let's think about that. What does that mean? Well, let's think about it. We've got one right here. The columns are linearly independent. How many columns are there? There's n of them. And if the columns are linearly independent, then what's the dimension of the space spanned by n linearly independent vectors? n. So this has to be n. How about uh, now talking about row reduction things? So A tilde, the row reduced version of the matrix, has no non pivotal, pivotal, has no non pivotal column. Okay. And finally, <coughs> A tilde has a pivotal one so the, the statement for surjectivity was was that you have a pivotal one in every row what's going to be the statement for injectivity pivotal one in every column 
wow. So I hope that you made it this far in linear algebra that all of these, this litany of, of things, you, you know all these terms and these, n n none of this is particularly new to you. <laughs> My experience tells me that's probably not entirely true. <laughs> Right. That's, that's why only, only square matrices can be bijective. Okay, how much time do we have? Lots of time. I'm going I'm to keep going. Uh, the last thing that we have time for, which is good because it's short, is that there is something called the rank nullity theorem. So let's write that down. Ah, I don't need the thing. So. Uh, a is a matrix, and we're construing it as being a linear map from Rn to Rm. <clears throat> so we've got, uh, we've got two things. On the one hand, we've got <clears throat> the dimension of the kernel of A. Another name for the dimension of the kernel of A, this is called the nullity. So nullity of A. And we've also got the dimension of the image of A. And what's the other name for this one? It's called rank. Rank. So the dimension of the kernel of A is the nullity of A, and the dimension of the image of A is the rank of A. And so now, here's the deal. The nullity and the rank are related in a very specific and important way. Uh, the nullity and rank are numbers. Okay, now I, I, know what you, I know what you mean. Yes? The dimension of the image is what? The space. I don't know the name left. Uh, the dimension of the image. The only, the only one that I really know its name by is rank. So. It's rank minus nullity. Equal to which one? N. N. The rank. Yes, the rank of A plus the nullity, nullity of A is the size of the input space. So that is to say, if you have something of, if, you, if your inputs have dimension three, what is the maximum output, what is the maximum dimension of all the output? Three. If you take a linear machine and you put a three-dimensional object into it, you can only get at most a three-dimensional object to come out. You could get a two-dimensional object to come out, or a one-dimensional, or a zero-dimensional, but it can't, you can't increase the dimension. So let's say that you put, you put a three-dimensional <coughs> object into a linear machine and a one-dimensional co object comes out. Then what's the nullity? Two. two, because two different dimensions were squashed. So what the rank nullity theorem is saying is that rank is, 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 in a sense, how much of the dimensionality is preserved, and nullity is how much of the dimensionality is destroyed. And it has to be constant. The sum has to be constant. See you next week. <laughs>